Here we go. Oh, wrong screen. You didn't see me. Hello and welcome to How to Be a Great GM presents the Training Grounds. My name is Guy and tonight we're going to be meeting a new GM and players as the GM takes us through another exciting adventure in the hopes of scoring well on the score sheet or improving an existing score. What am I talking about? Well, each of the GMs that are participating in Training Grounds have been given a predefined scenario that they will be required to run through the players tonight. The players are randomly drawn from those who volunteered to play in the game, as well as myself. And after 90 minutes of playing in the GM's world, the players and myself will get to score the GM based on certain criterion. The criterion I'm talking about is this. This is the scorecard that the GM will be aiming to try and hit the marks on. Now, bear in mind, the GM does not want to get the highest mark because that gives them no room for improvement or for betterment. This is not a competition about who is the best GM. This is a competition about oneself and improving on one's own abilities. Now, you can see we We've got various categories there. We've got the rules. How are they applied? Are they applied correctly or at least appropriately? There's story categories. What's the tone or the pacing like? There are NPCs, critical elements of the game, of course. There's style and then, of course, table management itself. So what will happen is each of the players and myself will give the GM a score out of five, meaning that there will be a total of 25 points that they can score per item. And at the end of it, I will present the score the uh, the scorecard back to the GM and to you, the viewers, and uh, take them through some of the salient points, areas that can be worked upon and improved upon for the following week. Of course, if this is the second week that they're participating, we will have that score sheet from last week. We will have a look at it and see where they should be aiming to improve. Now, at home, of course, you are watching this. You have that wonderful ability of not being completely ensconced within the game, not trying to play the game. So think kindly when you are judging uh, these individuals and uh, look at the scores and see how they would apply to yourself. At least that's part of the plan. But enough from me. Let's get on with the show and let's meet tonight's GM. Hello everybody and welcome to this very first stream of the training grounds where we take a GM, let them run a scenario for us and then give them a score. You've watched that video from earlier on on what it's all about and what it's all about is, well we had, guess what, <gasps> technical difficulties. Yeah, 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 we did. So right now someone is frantically running around in the background trying to make everything work whilst I talk to... You, you got that. That's right. I'm here talking to you just because well, I can. And I have to because we don't have a show for you yet. Uh, we will have a show shortly. Um, and uh, we will uh, make sure that that person has joined in as quick as we can. We had technical difficulties literally in the countdown as we were going to. And here we go. We've got two minutes to go. Technical difficulties jumped in. And they're not. They, they, I, I have to say they're not mine for the moment. Except for that first. Okay. Okay, never mind. Look, blame is not important. We don't have to shift blame or, or put anyone on the spot here. I understand it might be mine. Okay, so as we are waiting for someone to join in, I know the web goblin and the marketing goblin are on that as we speak. So uh, there is that happening. Um, the important thing to bear in mind with what we are trying to do here is the GM has been given a very cryptic two or three sentences from me in terms of the type of adventure they should be running. Now, if you are going to be a loyal member of the show and watch from the start to the finish, I may or may not have strung all of these adventures together into a grand campaign that each GM individually doesn't know about, but which collectively, hopefully, should actually come to the fore. We'll see. It's a big experiment on my behalf. Can 12 random GMs string together an entire campaign? We shall see. And they know nothing, Jon Snow. They know nothing. So uh, that is something to, to keep on. Now, with regards to the scoring, 
of the GMs. The score sheet is only available to the players uh, as, well, we've basically been involved in running and being in playing the game. So we have the perspective of actually being players. As outsiders, you would be watching and observing and being perhaps a bit more critical as it's not you on the spot having to make that fantastic role uh, to succeed or die in front of, you know, hundreds of people watching this show. However, having said that, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from watching the show, from making your own call. The score sheet is available uh, on the Discord server that we have set up to manage the training grounds. And I'm sure if we ask the web goblin or the marketing goblin very nicely, they would share that with everybody watching tonight. Actually, as a matter of fact, I can even bring it up. He said, fingers crossed. So there is the score sheet. You've seen it before. You've seen it now again. We will be giving the GM his scores at the end of the show. And uh, yes, give yourself an opportunity to go through these scores and to actually apply it to the GM um, in question or to apply it to yourself and see if you can improve in your next game. That is the bottom line there. So I am still waiting for someone to join um i'm watching messages here uh for people to join so um we'll just have to wait and see what happens there otherwise we have to continue with just these players not that i'd be unhappy with that um and of course being our first show this was bound to happen of course um so let's just see i see there a uh, player joining now says the web goblins <laughs> you know this is the joy of having goblins is they really cheap but oh my goodness anyway so we've got a brand new player who is now joining us and this poor player has not had any opportunity at all to be briefed by me so what i'm going to do is i'm going to play a very brief video for you which was going to outline some things to think about with regards to the rule set and the judging and the scorecard i should say so have a look at this whilst we say hello to our new player. In the rules category, the first item up for discussion and for scoring is the fair application to all. What does this mean, fair application to all? When a GM is going to make a rules call during the game, regardless of what system you're using, the GM should always make sure that they are at least making the same application of their rules to every player. There is a tendency sometimes for GMs to be a little bit more strict on players who know the rules very well and a little bit more lenient on those who are new to the game. Although this might feel as if you're treating everyone at their own level, it is unfair and we should try and apply it to everyone. So either we're all learning and upping our game or we're all playing a casual game where the rules don't apply. But it should be one or the other. By having multiple different options for each of the players, you can inadvertently start to alienate certain players or cause other players to go, well, why should I bother if he's just going to apply a random rule for me, but for them, they're not going to apply the same rule. She always gives her boyfriend preferential treatment. I should just do whatever the boyfriend's doing to get the same thing so we need to make sure that whomever or whatever we are gming at our table is applied to everyone equally the second section to look at is consistent application what is consistent application? Well, once a GM has made a rules call, regardless of whether it is the right rule call or not, for the remainder of the session, the GM should stick to that ruling. If she's made the call that the rule is that all characters can move at 35 feet per round, for whatever reason she's decided, then that should be applied for the entire duration of that session. If, on the other hand, one player gets to move at 35, whilst half an hour later everyone's only moving at 30, 
Unless there's a reason for the rule to change, such as strange physics or unusual environments, it's an inconsistency. We have to make sure that once we have made a rules call, that it remains in play for the duration of the session. Your alternative is to stop the session halfway through, admit that the rules call was wrong, or that it is a house home brew rule, or that the rule is going to remain in play. That's disruptive. We don't want to do that. We also don't want to run with a rule, get to the end of the session and have players going well that's weird can we change it for the next session to make it back in alignment with the rules or to make it a standing rule and the gm goes now nah, well maybe let's see how i feel next week consistency allows everybody to have an equal playing field and that's ultimately what we're looking for is we want the rules to be in the back supporting our game rather than driving our game or driving our players to distraction Okay, so we are ready to go. We have our uh, new player who has joined us. And so, without any other delays, let's meet the first team. Welcome, everybody, to Training Grounds. Look at them all waving and not saying a single thing. How polite they all are. That's absolutely Woo <laughs> There we go. Okay, so we have Stefan in the D GM seat. Stefan, welcome to the show. And tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been a GM for? Okay, so my name's Stefan. I'm um, from Germany, and I'm DMing for about like 20, 20 something years, but with breaks in between. Um, yeah. There we go. Fantastic. Why did you decide to come on the show? Um, I decided to come on the show because I think you never stop learning and it's important for me to understand where there are certain things that I can improve upon or in. That being said, I'm from Germany, so um, language-wise, that's also an opportunity for me to learn. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, we have some wonderful players who have joined us as well. And uh, although we don't have a time to get everybody's biographies on that, uh, we're all here to play a fantastic game. And we've all got new characters that some of us have read through and some of us have not. So let's see who's done their homework or not. I'm joking. Uh, if we could just work through the table telling the audience who we will be playing, that would be fantastic. And let's start with Michael playing Tajo or however you want to pronounce it. Michael, how are you doing and who are you playing? Uh, I'm doing absolutely fantastic. I am playing the role of uh, Tajo, the elven cleric, uh, the elven cleric of uh, the god of light, as it were. Um, I have decided to make this person uh, quite intelligent and sage-like, and that is who I will be playing. Fantastic. Moving clockwise, we have Sasha the fighter. Yes, I will be playing Sasha the Fighter today and uh, having a moment to look over her character sheet. She seems like a very, very conflicted person morally as well as um, just spiritually. So I'm definitely going to have fun playing with that sort of duality of her character. There you go. That does sound interesting. I will introduce my character quickly since you raised the issue of duality. I will be playing Ishkar. She is a tiefling who has been cast out of hell because she was too bad. Or perhaps not, who knows? She's on this prime material plane, seeking a way to get back to homeland. And perhaps this elf cleric might be able to help, or perhaps strong Sasha, who is very conflicted as to whom she should listen to. Uh, that's who I'll be playing. We then have, let's say, Bracklore. Yeah, I'm playing Bracklore. Uh, he's a... Uh... A wizard and he made some mistakes in his uh, experiments and he shrunk himself to 12 inches and uh, is now trying to gain back his dignity. <laughs> yes, a small mistake. And last but certainly not least, we have Binson. Hello, I'll be playing Binson. Um, he is a gnome rogue. Um, He's a criminal pickpocket, and he made a mistake that he's trying to make up for. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There is our ragtag bunch. And on that note, we now hand over to Stefan, who has 90 minutes to entertain us, thrill us, 
or just have fun playing a game. Let's do this. Okay. Well met, dear adventurers. We begin our tale in a remote village with the name of Lorcan, a rebuilt trading town in a vale somewhere out there. News have come to your ears that the priests of the God of Life, who have helped rebuilding the city, own a relic known as the Light of the Lifebringer, an ancient crystal which grants not only longevity to those who touch it, but also may offer a single wish at a certain day to a creature that is pure and honest at heart. And looking at the very characters in your group of traveling adventurers, boy, some of you need a wish, really. Today is the day of grand opening, but arriving early in Lorcan, you see that the annual ceremony not only attracted the many different folks, but also a traveling fair, which occupies the marketplace between the city gates and the old towering church of the Lifebringer. Standing at the center of the marketplace, all sorts of music blare from stages to your right that have been neatly arranged around the stone statue of a priest holding a crystal in his hand. The smell of roasted meat and fresh bread lingers in the air, dry summer air, as children race past by you, chasing a poor little white doggy. Glancing after the kids, you see others who listen to an old sage dressed in red robes and sitting in the shade of a gnarly oak tree close to the city walls. Yet, your spirits sink as you see a group of barbarians at the great wooden doors of the church who are in the midst of a heated argument with a priest. They seem to occupy the first place, granting them a higher chance to touch the crystal first and obtaining the wish spell for themselves. Standing at the entrance of the gates, what do you want to do? Well, these certainly seem like a set of unsavory characters. Let's at least, um, I mean, looking at everyone else, see uh, see if they want to approach and try to at least um, mediate the situation somewhat. You want to mediate the situation? I thought we should join up with them and take the town by force. We can burn it to the ground and make them all pay homage to our glory and power. Now, now, Ishka, as we always remember, sometimes it is much easier to be granted the gift of a reward rather than to pry it from the cold, dead fingers. Remember, there was that poor fellow and the rigor mortis that set in when you were trying to clench the, uh, what was it, Binson? Uh, it was, uh, what was, what was it holding in its hand while Ishka was trying to rip oh, it off? I think, I think he had a key. Yes, a key, that was it. Well, um, I mean, he was trying to. Well, let's not let things come to blow just yet. Uh, so uh, we can uh, let's at least approach and then see what has everyone so up in arms, or at least up in tone, and then we can gauge better from there. So you're going to approach the barbarians at the entrance of the church, okay? Mm -hmm. As you come closer, you see that the priest is holding out the hand, saying. Dear people, calm down, calm down. You're first in line, you paid the fee. We just need some time to arrange the ceremony. Just go with your friends, enjoy yourself at the festivities, and you'll be the first to go, which grants you chances for the wish. Nods to them, and he kind of wants to go to the door. The what? barbarians themselves, one is holding his belly. He's a bit like, he looks a bit sicklish in his face. Ah, oh, I still have hunger. And the other one goes, we have to wait. We have to stay first in the line. Why are they standing in line? The, I assume the priest heard that. And he turns around and says, oh, it's a grand day of ceremony. I guess over the course of the day, many will come and try to, after paying their fee, go inside and touch the crystal to have a chance for the wish and to be granted longevity. How much is this fee to enter? Oh, it's, it's just a gold coin, a small fee. Well, so of course I will go digging through my coin pouch, produce one gold and, and offer it to the priest. Oh. You can pay your fee now if you want to, and then go and enjoy the festivity, if you like. Uh, so I will we pay you, 
we pay you one gold piece and then we touch the crystal and we get a wish? Well, you certainly have a chance to get the wish. What and one do of you the, mean chance? One of the barbarian snickers. <laughs> first come, first serve. What do you mean chance? Well, the story is told that whoever comes first or the, the earlier you are under the morning light, the chances are higher, I guess. You're a bit late. Um, well, uh, f fear not, though, as a person who has seen many years as uh, the elf kind tend to live, the notion of immortality is sometimes often exaggerated by those not privileged with the right and wisdom of the ages. Um, Tajo kind of very passive aggressively kind of looks towards the uh, the orcs when he says that uh, especially the bit about those not blessed with long life and then he looks at the uh the orcs do you mean the barbarians oh yeah the barbarians sorry yeah oh yeah they're they're human they're human they're, they're not oh, orcs. human barbarians all right yeah. well, yes okay well they they scowl back at you like well when we touch the crystal first probably our chances are higher having a long longer life than you I want a word. Come with me, everybody. And uh, Ishka moves away from the barbarians and the priests, sort of trying to find a quiet area where there's not so much of the festivities going on. Sasha follows. Mm, as, you as you move on away, as you move away, shoulder. <laughs> as you move away, you hear the the older barbarian saying to the younger one, "I'll buy you some food." Just wait. Just don't drink that cow juice again. And the other one's like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, Sasha just quietly chuckles to herself. Oh, I miss barbarians. Okay, all that aside. Binsin, this sounds like something that you would be doing. This is a scam, clearly. The priest says that if we arrive late, there's no chance we'll get our wish. But we still have to pay one gold anyway. Surely this is something not exactly right. Uh, oh, definitely. I think we can scam the scam. I like that thinking. Excellent. What's the plan then? Well, we just need to figure out a way for us to be first over the barbarians. Just to make sure I'm not misunderstanding the situation, are we talking about... Um pilfering said item or just trying to steal in early mm. well whichever way works hmm well perhaps there is something we can do in order to um relieve these barbarians of their uh, position in line uh tajo looks around uh the the the, the town square um you mentioned that there is a, a festivity kind of going around i'm gonna mm -hmm. kind of look for like probably the most aromatic food store that happens to be you know within sensory range yeah i'm glad, glad that you asked to your left there are different um booths which are set up and you see a tall man with broad figures who has different kinds of like pastries and small little turnovers and and bread and next to it, there is a little girl with a um, two wheelbarrow and a sign says cockles, mussels, alive, alive. Oh, <laughs> that probably is like most of that. What And behind that are some different kinds of benches and people drinking beverages. Fantastic. I, I, I walk up to the, the small child and say, um, Blessings of Ido upon you, young one. Might I say your your wares are quite fresh and delicate. How much, perhaps, for your basket of delights? Oh, you want a basket of mussels and cockles? Yes, please. Oh, that would be two coppers. I uh, reach into my pouch and take out... Uh, uh, how many baskets does she have? Oh, well, just make it a dozen. Cool. I am going to take out uh, enough to pay for her entire store. And uh, <laughs> she's, oh well, my goodness, I'm rich. Uh, do you have any lemons? Of course. No one eats uh, mussels without lemons. Oh, you you are a true delight, young one. 
Um, might I ask for but one more favor, and there's a shiny silver piece in it for you if you do, but could you perhaps bring it to the, uh, and I'm going to point to like maybe like 30 foot away from where the line is mm -hmm. uh, and ask if she would um, so kindly set up a table for um, uh, some guests uh, with the uh, the spread of mussels and cockles and lemon and the like. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I can do this. And she hurries away and tries to get some help for people who support her in the task. I will uh, rejoin the uh, the others with, uh, and I'll reach into my kind of little ration pocket and pull out a small tiny cube of like lembas bread and just sort of nibble a little bit. Hunger is a great motivator. You think you are going to distract those barbarians by giving them seafood? Well, well, I well, personally have these food. And then also I have personally yet to meet a barbarian to turn around to turn down a strong drink. Yes, mm. drink maybe, but you know what? Let's go with your idea. Yeah? <laughs> I just want to have a quick word with Bracklaw and Binson over here in the corner about a completely unrelated object task thing. But I'm on your shoulder. You don't have to scream that loud into my ear. <laughs> I keep forgetting you were there. I remember when you were this. Yeah, okay, it's fine. <clears throat> a little boy looks at you. That's a funny bird. It's None like him, trust me. What do we do with the child? Can we eat it? Oh, it runs away. We don't eat human children. Exactly. They all look the same. All right, fine. Anyway, Binson, let's just have a private conversation about nothing. <laughs> we work. We walk further down the alleyway. Okay. So you move quite left to the church. You see um, some buildings and some alleys where you find a decent spot so nobody can hear you. Tajo and Sasha, where, while the others are going, is there something you specifically specifically want to do? at that moment um i i don't want to speak for tajo but uh sasha herself is going to try to do the whole thing just like oh bring us all the ale that we possibly can and then try to get the barbarians as as um libated as possible and mm -hmm. and but you know she'll just be like go to drink and then you know chuck it over the shoulder okay okay so uh as sasha's procuring the alcohol uh tajo will um take out a sign and basically just say uh, and write down free mussels and beer, and then just put it on the table that's been set up by the little girl. Okay, okay, great. So it takes you some time doing this. Now the other three, you are at the alley. Okay, it's not that I don't have any faith in Tajo, it's just that Tajo's an idiot. So <laughs> I suggest that we go with plan working, right? Binson. I don't know what the gods would say if we were to borrow this object, yes? Mm. Seems but fine I by me. I feel to make it fair for all of us, each one of us should get a wish, yes? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, that would be good, good, good. Yeah, so here's what I'm thinking. If I were to distract those barbarians by attacking them and ripping their heads off, then you two can sneak into the church. Uh, Bracklaw, you use your magical powers to do whatever it is that you do. And Binson, you just borrow the object for a couple of months or years or until we decide to give it back. Of course. But I don't want to have all the fun by myself. What about the others? Well, Sasha will come to my rescue because Sasha is a good person. And Tajo will be so desperately trying to prevent any kind of sacrilege from happening within the church, he will probably follow you in. Hmm. All right, but Vincent, can you can I get on your shoulder? Won't you? Of course. Hop All on. right. I'm scrambling on Vincent's shoulder now. Give give it a little pick up. Okay. All right. So the cue for you to make your move will be when the first barbarian starts to scream like a little girl. Is that understood? Yes. If I start screaming like a little girl, let me die. I will have dishonored my entire clan and will not be worthy of living. Okay. 
From that scenery, the camera kind of like flows back to the marketplace where a small, two small benches and a table have been set up and it's covered with mussels. Taji, you stick your sign in it saying free mussels and you see the one barbarian like shaking the other, I'm hungry, rushing to the middle and just start gobbling down mussels. Oh, that's good. That's good. And of course, have, as he's doing so, Sasha's just like, now don't forget to wash this down. Oh, a bra- beer. He cuts it down and entirely soaked with mussels. That, that one is absolutely devouring it. And you see that you distracted him, but the other one is still standing at the entrance. And while being kind of like, what is my friend doing over there? always shifts his attention back to the stages where you see three barbarians in front of a group of half orcs who are thumping on drums and using tubas to produce some loud music, shoving each other. Two of them are shoving each other. The other one is waving his arms frantically in circles and runs in circles too. And the old one always did enjoy the... Pardon? The old one and the entrance is always like looking over there. Um, and Sasha's just uh, certainly enjoying the 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 native um, flavor of of. I don't know if you would necessarily call it music, but she's just like. Okay. Um, Tadjo will uh, look over at the other barbarian and say, "Sir, why don't you come and enjoy yourself, please? I insist." And um, Tajo is going to create this moat of uh, glowing light around his hand as he casts uh, Command as a level one spell. And he's going to give the command, eat. Okay. I think he he has a saving throw against this. What is Uh, He does indeed. Yeah. So what is your spell save DC? Uh, Okay. So my spell save DC is a 12. A 12. He goes stiff, turns around and says, oh, yes, I'm hungry indeed. <laughs> and just passes by as you see that Ishka, Bracklor, and Binzen are coming from the side. I think Ishka is eyeing you with eyes like this, most likely. <laughs> as the, the, the other barbarian just left and Sasha, you see him also sitting down very robotically saying, I eat mussels. <laughs> and puts him in his mouth. <laughs> hey. um, Here's like Tajo's plan is working. Um, in which case, we just accelerate ours, yes? Definitely. Or do we, do we actually stick with Tajo's plan? Maybe we should probably actually just follow Tajo's plan. I don't know what's going on. I'm so confused right now. Well, okay. Uh, I'm going to try and sort of, as he comes out of the line, like before the line sort of collapses and eats up that space, I'm going to try and sort mm-hmm. of sneak into that little little gap there. Well, maybe I, I presented it wrong. It was not just like the barbarians in front of the door. So as they are gone, and Tajo, you are now in front of that door, where a line will fill up over the rest of the day, you see that the door squeaks open, both doors squeak, and the priest stands in front of you. Huh. So you're first in line, I see. <laughs> yes, it seems as those uh, as though Ido's will has uh has seen to bless me in first position. Idos, so you're a follower of the god of light? Indeed. The god of life himself bows to you, and seeing that you come from another chapter we think that half the fee is absolutely acceptable for you and your friends oh you are so kind the generosity of your church knows no bounds and uh much obliged to you and your clergy uh i will pay for myself and for the others uh and uh i will look around to see (laughs) to see um sasha and ishkar and and bracklor and binson and like pretty much the goofiest elf wave in the world like you know like you, you know you know when you like find that friend at a movie theater who's like saved on an entire row of seats by putting like his <laughs> shoe and his jacket and 
all this. Yeah, he's that friend who's just like, I saved us seats. Uh, so Sasha's just, you know, yes, on my way. And then she just kind of starts marching, uh, making her way that way. Vincent and Brackler, what are you about? Do you also just go to the Anhuns or is there anything else you'd like to do? Well, Brackler, are you all right if I uh, go over there? Yeah, just go ahead. I will just, uh, I'm clutching you, uh, the head of of Vincent and just yeah, like, hang on. Understand <laughs> what you move in there. Yeah. Okay. And Ishka? Ishka is absolutely gobsmacked that this plan has worked. <laughs> uh, Ishka is not the only one, I can think. <laughs> so Ish Ishka's just walking up. It's like, there's more to you, Elf, than meets the eye. What dark sorcery did you use to corrupt the mind of the priest, you wily thing you? Well, I mean, I am, of course, a servant of the God of Light, but yeah, yeah, with yeah, light yeah, yeah. comes Poisoned shadow. Him. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 dear Ishka, I did not. Except with good food. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of slurp down a muscle that I, I kind of grab on the way out. Yeah, yeah you realize it's really pretty much alive. Oh, oh. <sighs> well, you made it. While Brother Wilkie is giving you a rather uninspired lecture about the uh, god of life's noble deeds, you pass a first small entrance hall of the church and are being led into the crystal chamber, an astonishing place of great height, densely covered with myriads of gorgeous stone carvings that portray the god of light himself. Torches illuminate the windowless hall and a wonderful crystal in the middle draped on a golden pillow reflects the orange flicker, making the room appear to be in vivid flames. As you enter, a choir of priests starts singing a chant and all of you feel a vibration which sends goosebumps over your skin. In Congress to this, a shriveled old sprite with a tiny leech on his foot and mouth gag flutters quite bored in the air close to the crystal and holds his hands, gesture, gesturing the first of you to come closer. Uh, so uh, you, I was hearing you correct when you said that this uh, has a, a leash attached to it? Yeah, on his foot there's a leash. Mm -hmm. I am not okay with this. Or I'm sorry, Sasha is definitely not okay with this. Um, she, so... Uh, going to whatever the leash is tied to or if it's being held by a person she's immediately just like you know what is going on here why do you have a potentially intelligent creature in servitude okay um brother wookie faces you and says oh well it was our brother bertram who brought the crystal back from his hundred years of absence and this creature he brought along it was severely injured and she said that the mouth gag needs to be worn because of the severe injuries, which is not for the faint of heart. And his touch will indicate whether you are pure of heart and should touch the stone or not. It's something that Bertram specifically said should be left here or be here to guard the crystal. Okay. Um what would I necessarily need to roll in order to be to call BS on that appropriately? Because um, given Sasha's backstory, uh, as basically she was more or less forced into joining an order of paladins after her criminal background, she is very suspect when uh, people of a high and mighty nature just like, you should do this because we tell you and we are the good people. Okay. Um, so I think you can either go, absolutely go with religion or with history in this case because both would allow you coming from a chapter to know if there's anything that you might have heard that story, or if it's something of the nature of churches that you know. The others, while Sasha is eyeing this, is there something you want to do? The little uh, sprite with the mouth gag is just like holding his hand out to everyone. I don't trust very, very, very small things. Not you, Bracklow. You're excused, of course. You are, you are, you are not naturally the size the little one is. So it's very bad. Uh, how many spare wishes do we get actually? Oh well, the uh, 
crystal will grant a random person who touches it a wish at the day of ceremony. So it could be the first one, it could be someone later on, but the chances of course are higher the sooner you touch it. Uh, Sasha's history role was a four, so probably didn't reveal much more. Well, it, it kind of doesn't sound too odd to you, at least the story about Bertram had brought something mm-hmm. along, and which is a creature that understands the crystal. Obviously, the, the sprite doesn't look like he's about to flee or something, except the fact that it's pretty old, you'd say. Okay, okay. Hmm. Binzen and Tajo and Ishka, is there anything you'd like to do? I don't think so. I mean, part of me wants to try to, to free the little guy, but can't exactly do that in front of the priest, so... Also, the chanting is getting louder. <laughs> Ishker and Tajo. Brother Wilke. It is Wilke, yes? Yes, Wilko. Wilko. Oh, sorry, Wilke, Wilke. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm Wilke. Wilke, yeah. How many people would you say are in this grand edifice of yours are you a big order you have five ten sixteen guard uh, monks here or is it more like a hundred in your chapter i mean it's very impressive building i mean just look at the work over there i say pointedly pointing away from yes. everything in the room to the back uh, i mean that's clearly a carving of a thing yeah would you roll a deception roll for me please Sasha also wants to roll a deception just to be just like hmm <laughs> a flat 10 a flat 10 Wookie just stares at you yes this is very interesting indeed but you see that he's not going to move and he's not going to fall for that but still you should choose within your group and you see his eyes fling over to Bracklore if there's anyone who is probably in need of a wish, <laughs> why would I need a wish? Well, okay, I don't yeah. No, it's just that I have never seen a dragonborn being twelve inches. It's normal size. Wouldn't you mind being a bit bigger? Well, if you don't mind, you could wish for thirteen inches. And he shyly um, flies up from Vincent and is like, you guys okay for me to try it? And he goes to, um, okay. to the leash person, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, Ishka, is there anything? I'm just, T- Tajo, is there any chance that, that Brackle might just explode? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tajo uh, takes a moment while I mean, Michael gets his right? breath. <clears throat> well, all things considered, the spirits seem to have guided us here, and I'm sure the true answer to whether this will solve uh, or be a wish worthy of Bracklor is to be illuminated um, yet. But I, being an elf and a proud servant to Ido, I do not need another wish, for I have all that fills my very soul given to me already. So, Bracklaw, if you feel as though perhaps there is something deep within your heart that you would want, I suggest now you reach your hand and embrace the purity of this fine, strangely gagged creature. And I touch the hand of the gagged creature. Okay. Yeah. The sprite <laughs> touches. <laughs> you go like this. And the sprite goes like this too, trying to touch your hand. And you have that awkward moment where you both flap each other, passing each other. And then he grabs your finger, shakes it, and indicates over to the crystal. Looking to the guys, I'll fly to the crystal and it'll be just like, boop. Okay. Thinking about your wish, you stop and blink for a second. Is that a tiny little saw that is circling the floor around the pedestal on which the crystal rests. As you lift your eyebrows, the floor squeaks and tiles, pedestal and crystal tumble into the darkness below the church with a mighty crash. While all of you are still coughing because dust comes out of the 
of the hole and burns in your lungs, you see the, a head coming out of the hole. It looks like a very old man with two goat horns on his forehead and a grayish white goatee. His right hands lift panpipes up to his mouth as the creature fixes you, Bracklore, looks at you and plays doo -doo -doo on his panpipes. All of you, please roll me a wisdom saving throw as you hear that sound. Uh, Sasha got an effective 12. Mm -hmm. uh, Tajo got a 9. Okay. Vector got an 8. <laughs> um, I got a 17. Oh, Dinsen. Hey. Ishka got an 8. <laughs> <laughs> Dinsen, you really don't understand why all the others are frightened to death as they jump backwards hearing the music. All of the priests certainly are frightened and scared when they hear the dum 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 as you see the the goat man jumping down the hole and running away. And Vincent, as far as I see, you have dark vision. And as you look down the hole, you see something two little figures fluttering away, and they have little leather straps dragged around the crystal, dragging it into the darkness. All the priests start coughing. <laughs> the crystal! Get the crystal! But your friends are obviously right now in panic. What do you want to do, Binson? The crystal is being dragged away. Part of me wants to just jump down there, but I feel like I should get the rest of them to help me. Um, hmm. I'll try to. I'll try to get Ishka's attention and be like, "Hey, it, relax. We gotta go." No, it is the, the most terrifying thing ever. Oh no, it is. It is going to prevent us from dying a glorious death. We're gonna die as little old women, no, surrounded by die. loved ones. No, 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 you're not gonna die. It's okay, it's okay. Look, they took the crystal. Relax. Pull yourselves together. <laughs> Displaying all your all your courage, roll me a persuasion check, Binson. Oh, good. Uh okay, I basically got an un an unnatural twenty. Oh great. That's awesome. Because <laughs> Seeing Binzen in this dust, cloud of dust within the temple of light, all of you look to your friend with his like little figure because gnome, but still you're like, oh, this calms you down. You don't know why, but Binzen looks like the natural leader of your group, showing that he has the strength to pull you through this as you hear the crystal clunk, 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 leave into the darkness. The priest scream, get the crystal! What do you want to do? Well, uh, uh, Tajo is, oh, sorry. Tajo is going to cast light. And uh, as it illuminates this tiny spherical orb of energy, he's going to send it downwards towards the, uh, the hope opening to make it um, brighter. Okay. Okay. Um, after he sends his light spell down there, uh, Sasha draws her great sword and then just goes, um, huzzah, and then just, you know, just feet first down the hole. All the priests go, <gasps> Binson, Bracklor, and Ishka. Um, I'll jump down the hole. Bracklor is like shoving Ishka towards the hole <laughs> while flying. <laughs> yes, I'm yes, I'm going. It's just. It's, Come I, on. What was that power that that funny little hairy thing had? I've never felt so embarrassed in my life. When I find him, I shall cut his head off and drink from his skull. <laughs> but I will not be happy. I jumped down the hole. As uh, Taju, <laughs> yeah. uh, Taju will go to jump down the hole and uh, will tell um, uh, Brother Wilkie, do not worry, for we shall return the crystal from the darkness to the light. And Says then I'll you. jump down. <laughs> go, go, <laughs> run, he says. And as you jump into the darkness beneath the tunnel, your light, which now, like, it doesn't cast really any shadows, that's not what the light spell does, but you see a rough tunnel that's carved under the stone below the church, and it leads to a T-junction, just some 
some feet away in front of you. A glowing light in the left tunnel of the junction slowly fades, but the horrid smell of sewage burns in your, in your noses and you hold your breath. The sound of something heavy is being dragged on. Stone screeches in the distance, echoing in the tunnels before you. Hmm. Sasha's in the lead, right? I think Sasha was the first to jump down. And mm -hmm. we're basically entering this chase behind the crystal. I guess all of you just want to run behind the crystal. So all of you give me an acrobatics check to see whether you can chase behind the crystal or if you're falling behind. Uh, Sasha has a an unmodified 14. Okay. Uh, Tajo has a 22 with a natural 20. Reklaw is flying with a 13 behind them. Mm -hmm. um, I got a nat 20. I'm sorry, this is going to seem hey. sus. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> but I think Ishka is having a problem. Ishka has stopped. <laughs> <laughs> And is currently looking at her battle axe that she holds in her hands and is very quietly berating herself for being a coward and a letdown to her entire family <laughs> and that she should just abandon this entire folly and go back to tormenting souls in hell because she's clearly not cut out for this. She is having a crisis moment of note. Uh, and yes, on my roll of four, she ain't going nowhere. Well, Ish um, Ishkar, your um, your baggage is keeping you weighed down. You must relinquish it in order to keep up with everyone as we travel. A little piece of music was able to stop me. Your plan actually worked. You got us into the church in the front. The world has gone crazy. This is not supposed to have happened this way. We were supposed to have killed the barbarians in glorious combat, then pillaged the church and gone off into glory. Not be stopped by music played by a little child goat thing. So uh, when uh, when Ishka starts, you know, kind of just burying her soul and or at least her insecurities to everyone, Sasha, she just kind of um, chunks her great sword down into the muck or whatever to leave it sticking there at the T-junction, the goes over there and just starts you know jabbing her finger into ishka's uh chest plate or or axe or whatever the case may be and just like <gasps> i never expected to hear such words coming from someone like you i watched you rip the arms off of a kobold once did that and that was amongst 20 of his friends did that stop you then no uh that was an effective um 23 on the intimidation check to just be like nut up Pardon my language, by the way. Well, okay. I, I wouldn't roll against some intimidating a friend of yours. The other was against a spell effect. So um, I wouldn't roll with the intimidation here against Ishka. I leave it up to Ishka. If you feel intimidated and motivated to go on. Sasha touched my axe. That means she's serious. So that I will follow Sasha to the ends of the world. I pledge my very soul to your being. You are now my battle champion. Why are we waiting? Let's go. Uh, so Lynn. Sasha, oh, yep. go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, Sasha goes back to the T junction, saying, "You know, uh, I when I got here, I saw a light go around the corner that way, but I did also uh, hear something coming from the other direction, and I cannot immediately tell which way they have gone." Well, you see that Bracklaw and Binson have darted off into the darkness to the left following the light because mm -hmm. you two have seen something moving and you were not part of the group staying behind trying to motivate Ishka. So you two, Bracklaw and Binson, you race forward and you see two elderly pixies. They are trying to heave the crystal through narrow rusty sewer gates. As you approach, one pulls out a sc tiny scroll from his belt, reads something... <laughs> in his thin type high-pitched voice and a small portal appears under the crystal where it slits in you see it pop out on the other side and just fall on the grass next to the sewer two leather leashes tied around it the senile pixies turn around look at you and snap and disappear as something behind you goes sploosh turning around you see ishka who had a very low acrobatics check in the chase, being so 
in between because of what Sasha did and touching the axe that Ishka, you actually you stepped over and tumbled into the sewage. Please note on your character sheet that all charisma based uh, skill checks within this chase dealing with somebody else will be rolled with disadvantage as long as they can see or smell you because you have familiar turtles on your shoulder now. Oh, nine, Ishka, not again. <laughs> Every time, it's always Ishka. The others, you see Ishka crawling out, and I think all of you go to the sewer gate. You see it's rusty and it can be pried open, but you have to work together. To do this, all of you, roll an athletics check if you have profi <laughs> proficiency in that, or you go with a strength check to pry open the gates. I've got this, don't you worry. I have an 18. Um, Sasha has a total of 22. Okay. Got an eight. <laughs> Bracklore? I'm not a proficient in any of those. <laughs> I'm, well, I guess you're I'm not proficient either. You He's, guys, oh, yeah. he can, he can yeah. fit through. You, you're the motivator. No, maybe you can fit through. And Ishka, what, had you, what did you roll? Sorry. 18. 18. Oh, that's enough. Ishka, I mean, you reek, but still, you're pretty, pretty strong. And together, you pry open the gate, and it's enough that you, Breckler, could slip through. But what the nine hells was that? A blurred little creature with long, gray, blue beard hobbled, but still in an insane speed, passed by the sewer gate, grabbed the leather leash, and whoosh, dragged the crystal down the road next to the church. At the end, on a, well, it's just like running away. You hear screams of chaos and something's going out outside. We what need to get hell? this door open all the way so that we can... Yeah, pull. I'd say with all the... You had very good roles and that's enough for... I think, Ishka, you are so angry because of the way you look and things run for you. You just tear out the bars Arr. that's a display of power right there as you all manage to squeak through Brecklaw, you're standing at the street because you were first to go out and you see that at the end of the road a group of of, of dwarves and um, halflings are are punching satires on the street, they're rolling around in a fist fight. And that little grandpa quickling thing just stopped, turns around, sees you, and darts into an alley. The alley where you were standing with Binzen and Ishka next to, beneath two half timber houses. As he runs inside, you hear screams and whoosh, a cloud of children runs out, ah, dog! And they come into your general direction. Hey, children. You I'm going to point out the, the house <laughs> to the other guys when they come out. There they went. We have to go after them. Uh, Sasha just starts trudging directly that, that direction at, at which he points. I leave this up to you how you want to go past children. I have a faint idea what Ishka is going to do if I leave it up to you, but you can use whatever skill role you think is appropriate for this. Though I make it a group challenge, you have to um, be you have to beat the um, difficulty check. So look at your sheet and then tell me what you think your character would do and which skill he or she would use in this situation to get past screaming children. I suppose I can't just cut their heads off. Yes, I no, said skill not check, not time. melee attack, <laughs> but I would leave that entirely up to you if you go oh. down this path. Uh, between Ishka and myself, who's taller? That's a good question. I think you are. Okay, um, because, so, Sasha, she basically just pulls an Andre the Giant from Princess Bride, and she just goes, Everybody move! <laughs> uh, and that is... I rolled a 10 on the intimidation, so I get plus 4 to intimidation, so that is an effective 14. Okay, that intimidated some children and the others. What are you about to do? I'm. Give me a sign if you found something because I don't want to uh, rush you. Okay, Bracklore. 
um, regular is at this point just like pissed and is like breathing fire in front of the children. And he's like, I don't even care. At the children or over the children? Like, to- yeah, like to scare them off. Okay, okay. So I guess you can also roll with an intimidation check for that. Sure. And you know what? If you can really breathe fire, do that with advantage. I mean, it's yeah, children and it's that. fire. Sure. <laughs> oh, that's a uh, natural 20. <laughs> oh, no. Um, Char- or 21. <laughs> Sus, no. <laughs> okay. That's a great effect. That could bold- booster your group if somebody fails. Now, Ishka, you had your hand up too. Yes. Seeing my war leader has now taken on the intimidation role, I can follow suit. I just swing the great <laughs> axe above my head, planted in the ground. By the spawn of all of the devils in all of the hells, I will eat any one of you that comes near me. She means it too. <laughs> <laughs> and and Tredalus falls off your shoulder, which makes it even more dramatic. <laughs> hate the turtles. Um, <laughs> uh, that was a 16 on intimidation okay children screaming running passing by oh my god she reeks they that just go everywhere Tadra and Binzen um, so Tadra is uh, is going to basically see um, the children starting to uh, to scatter and run uh, the chaos that seems to ensue um Tajo is going to use a mixture of different things. Okay. Uh, because he wants to be intimidating, but Tajo is not really a very scary individual, he's going to do this player-wise as an intimidate, but character-wise because he thinks it's the nice thing to do. I'm going to take my holy censer out of my backpack and fill it with some incense and then cast Sacred Flame upon the uh, incense itself to make a glowing light of... These, this incense, and um, seeing t- uh, Ishka's sort of permeating smell, I'm going to start swinging it around my head, like try, trying to basically uh, get rid of the smell. But what it looks like is this mad as heck elf swinging this flaming <laughs> flail. <laughs> Whoosh! Power of Ida upon ye! As, as, as I'm uh, yeah, following Ishka, uh, also making an intimidate check with said thing. Okay, uh, great. Um, so that is an 18. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Children, they cover their heads. They fall on the ground, bow, bow before you. Oh, my God, the priest commands us. And try to just <laughs> get away from you as Binzen. Well, they're all doing great. So I just want to nimbly get around this chaos. So probably acrobatics. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Hey, cool. Yep, I got an 18 plus 6, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Binson, you're already, like, the acclaimed leader of the group, even though <laughs> probably not all still accept this. Uh, could you describe how you do that and and push your way into the alley? Um, let's see. I'll push past some kids, maybe jump on, on top of some heads, you know, kind of like crossing a stream but full of children, um, and then, you know, maybe do a flip and land next to the door, and yeah. And all of the others, you see this, and as a full group, because you did so well, you're all inspired. You can check your inspiration on your character sheet for the way you did that, because it was such a display of might what you did. You, Binson, enter the alley, and you see an enormous black watchdog with a spike collar. The small white doggy that the children chased at the marketplace is standing under the doggy, barks, at something that's at the ground and you see the quickling the it looks like a grandpa quickling you would say he's like just like dragging himself away from the dog ah, makes some noises and the dog has the crystal or he has the the leather straps in his mouth <laughs> shaking it from left to right because he stopped the quickling. What do you want to do? He did not notice you, though, because both are f- looking at the little creature. Perfect. If I'm not noticed yet, I would like to try to get around it, so... Okay. How'd you do that? Stealthy time. I'm gonna try to sneak by. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so that is a 13. A 13. Actually, this is enough, and you are close to the dog. You are now behind the big black dog. The white doggy just runs behind the little quickling, dragging himself away, running in circles. You know, all of us know these little dogs who just run, jump around all the time, and they do nothing, but they're extremely loud. They're like the loudest dog out there. Exactly. He's doing that thing to the quickling who covers his ears and tries to get away. The other one hasn't seen you. It's your you have a good chance of using a slate of hand to get the crystal from his mouth because he's just gone berserk. But pass by the dog, you see your friends entering the alley. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to steal it. Okay. <laughs> then roll for it. Uh I only got a five. Don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I'd like to point out that we could break the rules here out for dramatic effect. You're still inspired. <laughs> you should normally would say that beforehand when you roll, but I will allow you under the given circumstances to re-roll if you like. Sure, let's do that. Nope, it didn't get any better now. It's just a six. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> you failed us. Yeah. The dog sees you. He's a bit scared at that point. Whoa, whoa, jumps into the alley. And then you hear him whoa, 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 run around. He turns around, whines, and darts past your group without the crystal in his mouth. All of you stand in front of that side alley, which leads back to the marketplace. And now it goes like another way around. And you see an old withered, I'm, go I'm going to mispronounce it, dryad. Is it dryad in English? Yeah, I think so. So you see an old withered dryad that looks more like a frail stick that comes in front of the alley. And he drags behind himself footprints that looks like they're painted with dark acrylic paint. The smell of mold creeps into your nostrils as it leaves its rotten arm and points with his finger covered in sickly green gray bark skin at the crystal, which is halfway distance between you and the druid in the middle of the alley. The heart of the Feywild belongs to night. It calls in a language that you understand and whips through his sicklish green hair. Creatures of the Feywild, we have traced the imposter, Bertram and the thieves who got the crystal, attack. And you see a satire and a set of pixies rushing into the alley. Roll initiative. Just keep it and I'm going to ask you what you had. I told you this world was upside down first. You get us, your plan works, Tarjo. Then suddenly someone else steals the crystal before Benson can get there. Who else is a better thief than Benson? Then children start bowing to you? Not to me? What is this? This is insanity. <laughs> this is crazy. And now the little dog has been running under the thing. And there's a tree talking. It's just nuts. Well, you know, Ishka, if the, uh, if the dog did, of course... Uh, managed to touch the crystal, it might also be an immortal dog now. <laughs> you can't let that happen. Okay, each guy's baffled, so we go with Tadjo. What did you roll for initiative? Uh, I got a 17 on my initiative. Okay, Tadjo has got a 17. Um, Binzen, what do you have? I've got a 4. Okay. Um... And Bracklow, what do you have? 21. Okay. Dang. <laughs> Is any one of you higher than Bracklow with 21? No. Okay. Then, um, Tajo. Ishka, what do you have? Five. Okay. Five is Ishka. <laughs> and Sasha. Sasha has a 10. Sasha has a 10. Okay, very good. And 
now we go for it. And the first thing that happens is that the satire bow, bows, his head, bows his head and you see he has this gray goatee. You don't know where he come, came from now, but he darts through the alley. And who's in front of you? Who's standing first in line? Closest to the, the dog? Mm, well, like in the middle of the alley now is the crystal. The white dog just also ran away. And at the end of the alley, you see the dryad dri 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 <laughs> coming with all the fake creatures. And you're at the other end of the alley. Well, if uh, Ishka has an opportunity, she would be moving to the front to protect everybody else. Fair. If all the others agree, so Ishka, you are front, and the satire runs screaming at you and tries to ram you with its head. Um, Bring and it, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and Billy knows what he's doing and punches you with the head into your stomach as he effectively rolled a 17 and that hurts my friend that hurts that hurts badly um that actually is seven points of damage Fine. and you see ishka is hit by the goat man in her stomach Ooh. next one would be Bracklor. next to you the satire just ran into ishka bad day for ishka um, can I get them all into like a 20 foot, uh, not cube, but a sphere? Who exactly do you mean by all the, of them? The, um, the satire, the th satires. Um, it's just basically a satire and a bunch of pixies and a dread. Oh, okay. Dread. Oh God, why did I pick that creature? And the pixies okay. are on the side of the satire? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I want to aim at them and, uh. I'm going to throw up some sand and I'm casting um, sleep. Lieber Sandman, sleep now. Oh, okay. They understood that face German singing. <laughs> Get my... 5v8, uh, that is. 5v8, uh, give, me, give me a second. Sure. I've got just one 88. Tato, you would be next, so... Probably, but I guess you already know what you're going to do, knowing you from our 70 minutes we already shared in our life. Uh, it's a 26. Okay, a 26. That is enough for the pixies at least to fall over. And um, I think they have a saving throw against that too, do they? Oh, uh, let me check. Hmm. For the sake of quickness, we just say you blow out the candles of the um, pixies. They just poof, fall to the ground. But the dry, dry oh god, um, that creature I'd give a um, saving throw, and I think the dryad managed it. Shakes off the effect and looks at eyes you, and the eyes go pitch black. You still can move, Bracklore. Um, gotta hide behind Sasha. <laughs> Oh, Smite okay. them, please. <laughs> <laughs> Tajo, the little dragonborn just flutters by and just holds on behind Sasha. Uh, Tajo, uh, seeing um, Bracklaw, uh, you know, sort of getting behind a defensive line and Ishka taking quite the, the nasty uh, gut blow by the, uh, the horned uh, creature. Uh, Tajo still has the uh, sensor in his hands and he's, again, still been sort of swinging it around. This time what he does is he channels um, his healing energies. May the light of Idaho heal and stitch. May it guide your wounds to recovery, Ishka. And I'm going to, because he smell, uh, because Ishka kind of smells, uh, you know, he doesn't really want to touch the old woman. Uh, <laughs> so he is going to use the sensor and just bang him on the back with it. <laughs> um, but then cast, uh, uh, I want to cast, uh, cure wounds because I'm a life cleric. Um, I get some extra bonuses to that. And, uh, you you took seven damage. You heal eight. So, I mean, you're, you're better. All better. <laughs> you're better. <laughs> Small glimmer of light in a bad day for Ishka. <sighs> Sasha, you hear a bong, <laughs> and Ishka is in, filled with gleaming light and looks way better now, not holding her stomach. 
Um, then as a uh, oh, bonus sorry. action, uh, what I would like to do is I, I turn to Ishka and I say, do not worry, Ishka. Should you fall in battle, I will dedicate my life to learning the reincarnation spell so that you might come back as a as an elf. And then maybe perhaps you will be valiant in battle. And I'm going to try and use it to basically provoke <laughs> Ishka into a rage. <laughs> 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 hmm. Well, uh, as the first thing that Sasha does is she tries to get herself between the the satire satyr. I'm I'm unsure how to pronounce it, but uh, she wants to do her best to get herself between that and everyone else in the party. Mm-hmm. And uh, if she can, she'll then take a, a mighty swing with her greatsword. Certainly, you do, and you try to whack the creature. Okay. A, I rolled a 12 and I get a plus five. So that is an effective 17. It connects and you bring down a sword and hit it in the side. It screams at, as blood flows out of it. Okay. 2d6 plus three. It's two. Uh, so that is seven damage total. Okay. That certainly hurt the creature and it bleaks. Bah! Um, the dru- dryad. Um, <laughs> it looks at Ishka and connect connects at you with its black eyes, and you feel as though the creature, with its charming part, tries to ask you for your assistance now that you're healed and ready in battle you could tear off the heads of your friends if you just turn around and chop at them there's only one friend whose head i want to tear off right now well the voice in your head changes like then you can chop that head off it's up to you but please roll me a wisdom saving throw four that is not enough. No. And going with the drama, I said it to Binzen. Now I allow it to you too, Ishka. You can re-roll using your inspiration if you like. But you could also call for blood and kill all your friends. I feel like I'm going to go with the inspiration burn, <laughs> but it's only because of time. Um, six. Well, there will be blood. Ishka, it's your turn as the druid points to your friends and says, Choose. You want me to turn into an elf? You want to bring me back when I have failed in battle? I have had enough of this insanity. This day is clearly wrong. I am being tortured by the nine hells for my actions. You will die. Ishka is going to (laughs) rage. Uh, was already raging, I really feel. And then we'll just swing her battle axe in a wide arc towards Tajo as hard <laughs> as she can. The massive battle head, battle axe swings around. The air whistles her rage. Bits of slime from the sewer spray out on either side of her as her wet hair swings around. And she connects at a 22. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that'll hit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you take a whole three damage. Oh my goodness. I couldn't roll lower. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably the best time you could roll that low. As you, Taj, you'll see your friend turn around and attack you. My axe is broken. This is the worst day ever. <laughs> and Benson, your Swing friends are attacking each other. Um, I want to try to shoot the the dryad for you know magicking Ishka. So yeah, go forth. Oh no, I got a one. Well, that will not hit. <laughs> well, <laughs> your you have a short bow or a, a, a ah crossbow? short bow. Short, a short bow. bow. The arrow just flies wild. <laughs> And down the road, you hear someone, ow! (laughs) 
hit something. <laughs> it's not the target. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to move? Um... To your left, you see Sasha still battling the satire, satire, or whatever. And the gnarly oaken creature tries to go forth and wants to go to the crystal. Um, sure, I'll move a little closer to the crystal. Okay. So if you go all your speed, it's like half the distance to the crystal. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, the satire is back on. Scowls at you, Sasha, and tries to hit you with a small short sword that the beast pulled out of its trousers. Um, oh, a 19, that hits you, most certainly. But it only connects for five piercing damage as it slices through your armor. And then it's Bracklaw's turn again. The satire just hit your friend. Ishka's wild, smacking Tajo. Binson reluctantly goes forth. And the druid, at the end, calling himself Knight, is trying to reach the crystal. Bracklaw just throws his hands on his head and be like, <laughs> what do I do? And... Uh... Would would he know that the uh, the spell would be broken if he dies? Um, well, that that Bracklow knows. If right. something that tries to charm is dead, the charm ends. I'm going to fireball his ass and. Um, okay, why not? Yeah, cast that. So that's a range spell attack. That's mm -hmm. a natural eighteen. <laughs> um, Plus, I don't know, what is it? Oh, that hits, that hits, absolutely. Right. <laughs> 1d10. Uh, two fire damage. Okay, but you see that the effect is even harder as it looks like a little dried twig and it starts burning. It <laughs> slaps itself. Um, that hurt, but it wasn't that much. It could have been better. You think if you... If you invoked more power and the spell would have been more powerful, certainly the effect on that tricky creature would have been even greater. Tajo. Uh, Tifling. Tajo uh, oh yeah, Tajo reels back from the uh, the swing that Ishka took. Um, it was very, it was shallow, but enough to, to cut through his armor. As Tajo looks, he places his hand on the bloody wound and then looks at it and then looks at Ishka and says... I don't... I understand. I may have gone too far, but know this, Ishka. I forgive you. No! <laughs> Do not forgive me! You should fight me! <laughs> no, no. I, I could never bear arms against someone like yourself. The light has chosen you. It shines upon you with the same radiance that I see in all around me. And as she, uh, as, as Tajo stretches his uh, hand forward, I'm going to cast Bless on uh, Ishka, uh, Bracklaw, no, actually, Ishka, Sasha, and Binson. Uh, I'm going to cast Bless. The blessings of the light even find us in this dark alleyway. Ido knows and grants you strength even here. Uh, everyone will gain a uh, d4 whenever they make an attack or a saving throw uh, at once um, before um, the end of the round. Or a minute before a minute, so you got a minute to use it as a charge. Nice. Uh, you get a one d four. So again, yeah. um, and yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll just forgive Ishka as a bonus action. Tajo, who was that too? Sorry, I, I didn't catch who you cast it on. Uh, so Ishka, Sasha, and Binson gain uh, bless. Sorry, Blackmore. <laughs> well, okay. certainly favorites. Certainly blessed, Sasha. You feel the tingling of the god of light in your neck. What are you going to do? The satyr swings at you. Well, uh, so Sasha is going to immediately, you know, just basically haul the great sword back in a sort of almost um, baseball swing and just kind of give a try to give a cross chop down on the satyr, satyr, uh, and roll a d twenty. Uh, that is an effective nine, so that misses. That misses the set high and it <laughs> looks at you and laughs at your puny attempt to kill it. And I didn't use my blessed, so but that wouldn't have helped anyway. Mm, well, you had you rolled a nine, then you have a bonus of plus five, I guess. 
if I've seen that. Oh, sorry, I, I rolled a four and I have oh, a bonus. Okay. So the, the total was nine, but even with my bless, I would have gotten a max 13. No, I think that would not connect to the satire. So it still laughs, even though you both calculated it for a second and it still laughs. Um, <laughs> the druid. Uh, Binson, you see the creature walking up in front, taking the crystal on the leather straps, holding it up, holding it up, and says, "The heart of the Feywild. Ah, uh, will you come back with me?" Drags it back and just turns around and tries to leave the alley, not giving you a single glance, showing you its backside, leaving the oily footprints. That's. Everything the Druid does, Ishka, it's your turn. Tajo blessed you. He mocked you with the spirit of his godness, goddess of light or god of light. I'm still under the compulsion to attack Ishka, uh, to attack Tajo. Well, it says for 24 hours, so I guess yes. I will gut you and wear your intestines for goddesses as I dance upon the grave that the peasants will dig for you once I have cut their heads off. I hate everybody. Uh, hit an armor class of 14. That'll miss. And Taja will say, it is okay. I still love you, Ishka. <laughs> no, stop the thing! Uh, that's all that Ishka's gonna do. Okay. Um, Binzen, to your left, your friends Tajo and Ishka are... Well, Ishka's trying to smack the hell out of Tajo, and he's just <laughs> complimenting her for doing so great. But the druid still is trying to leave, having the crystal in its hand. Mm. I need to stop the druid from escaping with the crystal. So, um, why don't I just try to attack it since it's turned away from me? How far away is is he? Well, well, I'd say it's in your he's, it's in your range. You can okay. run up and try to attack yeah. it. Yeah. Though. That's you're going to leave some um, some sound. You may create some sound. Probably going to look over its shoulder as you run across with your hand, a weapon in your hand. Yeah. What are you going to do with which weapon? Uh, my rapier. Okay. Just gonna try to get him in the back. So, yeah. um, I guess I'll use the the d4 for attack. Mm -hmm. So I'll roll both of those. All right. Oh man, I got a one again. Darn it! <laughs> you used all your luck in the beginning, as no. you <laughs> put your raper into the into the um, wooden creature, which just like uh, wipes it away. Uh, it's still not very impressed though, as the satire, which is bleak and bah, tries to attack Sasha. Sasha, it hits you again with this sword. Mm -hmm. Having rolled a, uh, let me check, it rolled a 20, I guess. Um, a dirty 20 hits you. Yes, Sasha's AC is 18. Okay. Oh, oh. and that is nine points of damage. Ooh, I've got one left. Okay. <laughs> It sticks its sword sword into your belly, turns it around like, oh, I don't want to die. Ugh. Ah, Brecklor, it's not looking too good. The so druid... Sasha looks like he's going to die, and how's Tadger looking? Uh, he made I've peace with I, I've taken three damage. I'm, I'm okay. Oh, okay. So he was about to <laughs> cast Charm Person on uh, Ishka, but then he sees Sasha and he's like, no! And he's going to cast Firebolt again at the bad guy. Okay. That's a 16. A 16 at the um, Druid. Mm -hmm. Okay, that hits to the bark okay. skin. And that's, uh, oh, that's uh, 10. 10. Woo! Now this hurts. You see the twig creature getting, where did you hit it? Describe where your fireball, how it leaves your hand, what it looks like, and where does it hit the creature? Uh, Brackler is like casting it with his fingers and making it 
um, dance between the fingers and then flaps with the wings and then it shoots out and just burns it from the from the feet up upwards. Okay. It waves its arms. No! As a black portal appears and it falls into it, leaving a trail of dust, smoke, and ashes as the crystal tonk lands on the ground next to Binzen, who's quite surprised about that effect from your fireball that Binzen certainly has never seen. Instantaneously, Ishka, the effect on you stops as you see your bloodied friend in front of you. Um, and it's Tajo. Um, all right. So, uh, seeing Ishka, do, do I, do I see any visual that Ishka is sort of coming to their senses? I'd, I'd say yes, Ishka, how would you describe that? Yeah, Ishka is still raging, she's angry, she's confused, she doesn't know why she's trying to hit you. You kind of maybe get the sense that she's just going to carry on anyway, because if she was hitting you for a reason, she was probably justified in doing it. Uh, she yeah, just can't remember right now why she was. But uh, she might not as well. Very well. In which case, uh, as a bonus action, um, um, Tajo uh, raises his hands. Uh, he, he kind of drops the uh, the sensor that he's been waving around. Uh, and he opens his arms into like a, almost like a warm embrace. And uh, from deep within his uh, his chest, you hear, Praise be to Idos, whose power and reverence lies in all the wonders of the world. May your fear spirit flow into my humble friend. And though she may cut me down, I'll forgive her anyway. And I'm going to try and hug Ishka as a uh, as a standard action with a with a big hug and as my bonus action i'm going to use healing word on sasha and you hear a chant of priests from behind the alley again <laughs> um all right yay that is uh do, 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 four five six seven eight uh eight hit point healing Yep, you heal eight hit points, Sasha. Most excellent, thank you. Great, Sasha is back in the game. And still in front of you is the goatee creature that looks over its shoulder at the dryad, dryad which just disappeared. Looks at you angry, <laughs> holding the short top, but you see that it kind of tries to go backward, mm -hmm. slowly. Oh no, he's not getting away that easy. <laughs> Uh, that is a roll of 11 plus 5 on my uh, great that sword. Is. That is an effect. Yep. 16. Yeah. So 2d6 plus 3. That is an, a, a total of 9. 9. Okay. How do you want to do this? Uh, so Sasha is is not happy. Let's just put it that way. But nowhere near as furious as, as Ishka is capable of getting. So she's literally just going like haul straight back and just sledgehammer swing down on this thing. And you hit it on the neck, you hear a fierce cracking sound, something opens up and in a bloody mess it lies on the ground, just twitching a bit. <coughs> now everything that's left in the alley is the crystal next to Binzen and we drop out of combat order. I have to ask how long is the gaming time because I you totally have 11 forgot. 11 minutes. 11 minutes. Okay, <laughs> totally great. The only thing that's in this alley are the three sleeping um, sleeping pixies that nobody really touched and ignored. The crystal next to Binzen. And a small white dog that just shoots out and barks at Ishka and runs away. Runs again away. <laughs> I'm so confused right now. Why? Who and what are we doing? Why am I hitting you? This is okay. It, it, yeah, Why are you fine. hugging me? What the hell? It's okay. That's fresh just, torture. Just breathe it in. Breathe it in. What are we doing? We're hugging. We're forgiving. <laughs> Is she calm uh, now? I think she's calm. I, I release my hug. 
Brax so, opens, and then Sasha, you see this intimate moment between Tajo and Ishka hugging each other. What do you like to do? Do you uh, want to join in the group hug, or is there anything else you could imagine doing? Um, just because of Sasha's own paranoia, she tries to find some way, shape, or form to um, bind, or, I mean, I know that they're small creatures, but the pixies, like, we don't know what they're going to do when they wake up, so Sasha's going to be just like, um, she has two of them, but we'll see, I don't, she can't hold the third one. Okay, Bracklor and Binson. I just want to pick up the crystal. I want it to be safe. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm worried about my main guard. I was just, yeah, like we fought so hard. <laughs> and Bracklore? Yeah, I'm also going to check out the crystal. Okay. You two see the crystal is totally fine while Sasha is tying up two of the pixies because you're not really harming them. They're still asleep. So you can tie up their tiny little hands and put them somewhere at the side of the alley, um, which you can do with the third one as well. Mm -hmm. Tajo and Ishka, while you finish hugging, you see that the uh, brother Wulki is coming from the other side of the alley where you entered and saw the black dog and looks at you. Did you get the crystal? Please lie. Well, that was already the plan. <laughs> it needs to be returned back to the crystal chamber. Else the wish is not effective. Oh, look, I'm gonna keep it some lovely line. architecture. Uh, Tajo's going <laughs> to examine the walls. Uh, okay, well, he's not in his natural habit of his church, I'd say. So why not roll deception? <laughs> oh, I'm going to roll deception. Okay, I guess. Oh, geez. All right. Uh, oh, it's, that's a 12? No. <laughs> he's like he did to Ishka, he's just looking at you. Oh yes. <laughs> this is yeah. absolutely a wall. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now where so, is the crystal? Oh, oh, sorry. No, I'm not I'm sorry, let me let me rephrase that. I'm not telling him to look at the wall. Oh. As the good cleric of non-deception and stealing from other churches, <laughs> I am going and examining this wall all and all on my own because wow, what fascinating <laughs> ah, while okay. they uh, while they try to steal the rare artifact. Oh, ah, okay. So well, he's just seeing you and Ishka, and then he gives you this. Okay, he's mad. Kind of <laughs> glance and looks at Ishka. Where? Where? Yeah, the it's crystal? it's wall. Look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we roll that. You roll deception too, but though you're reeking. Ah, with that with <laughs> doesn't matter. Natural it doesn't one. matter. <laughs> do, do I give it? Do I give him advantage because I'm looking at the same wall? <laughs> Balance it out. I mean, uh, maybe there's something there. Well, I, technically, you could say you're assisting each other in that crude, strange way. <laughs> but because he had disadvantage and you gave him advantage, it's just like one this roll and it's a one. one. So yeah, Ishka kind of like tries to inspect the wall, which is the worst effort of an actor ever done to a wall. She's still confused about the hugging. The others in the alley, Sasha, you tied up the uh, pixies, Binson and Brackler, you have the crystal. It looks intact. It's like it's okay. Not Nothing torn or broken from that wild chase. And you hear Brother Wookie, Wookie's voice from down there and see your friends starting to touch a wall after they hugged each other. He said it w wouldn't be effective if we would use it outside the church, so should we bring it back? Could be lying. So Sasha is going to just stand behind the, the priest and just give uh, Benson just the... <laughs> it's intimidating. <laughs> What are you trying to say? Why doesn't he open his mouth? I mean, I, uh, Sasha can roll an intimidation because she knows what Benson's trying to do and just being like... <laughs> <laughs> Me still trying to put it in my bag. Like, it's fine, guys. It's fine. <laughs> 
do me a favor and roll a slate of hand check. <laughs> and Brackler, I think you're kind of like assisting Binson right now because you said you're also caring about the crystal, right? Um, no, or would you just would you go confused with by Sasha's? <laughs> he wants to know what's what's that's about. He's looking intensely at Sasha's face. <laughs> What so the twelve-inch dragonborn stares back at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Sasha has a strong suspicion that Benson is going to be just like, "This is mine. I don't know what anyone else is talking about." <laughs> and and Sasha's just like, "But I want to wish." But if I share it with you, will you not tell the priest? Okay, fine. Routine. <laughs> That that's the best you're going to get from Sasha is okay, fine. <laughs> she morally is just like, I don't know, but at the same time, benefits. <laughs> okay, that's as much as you can get from her, so that's not enough for a support to give you advantage on your roll. So please roll me a slay or hand check. Okay. All right, I got a 12. You got a 12. And brother Wookie. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> comes from the side glances into your alley turns around looks at the wall and says <laughs> is that crystal here in the wall or what and he starts looking at the wall over the shoulders of Ishka and Tajo because he totally missed to see you putting away the crystal and after a while you figure that brother Wilkie will not find out where the crystal is because he and a bunch of priests are still looking at that wall while the bunch of you five <laughs> go outside the city gate having a crystal not knowing exactly how it works as we end our little adventure for tonight lovely Right, thank you very much with three minutes to spare. There you go. All right, folks. So now um, this brings us to the uh, near finish of the show. All that remains now is for the players to have the very difficult task of scoring the GM in terms of how we feel that uh, Stefan did today. And uh, whilst they're going to be doing that, I'm going to play for you another video clip where I talk about the scores. If you haven't noticed, they are down below all of the different things that we will be looking for and scrolling through. So give us a few minutes to put those scores together and when we return, we shall reveal everything. In the rules category of the scoring card of Training Grounds, we come across the Used Appropriately section. What does this mean? Well, once you have applied a rule, or once you are using a rule, has it been applied appropriately? In some games, you might have the rule of cool, which means the rules are applied when they're needed, but if the character is doing something cool, well, then maybe they don't need to be applied for this particular session. You want your character to somersault through the air, land on the back of the giant four-headed mammoth, and slay the dragon with a bow and arrow that they have just fired using their feet, the rules might say that that's not possible or that it will take you a good 10 to 15 rounds to set up all of that combination. Rule of cool might be, well, no, it doesn't actually need to happen. Let's just make it more dramatic because the creature's on one hit point anyway and whatever the damage is done, the thing will die. So the rules don't apply here, but, well, that might be an appropriate rules call. It very well may be, or maybe not. The exact swing of that is my character takes a step forward. Great, I want you to make an acrobatics check because the ground is slightly uneven. I succeed. Excellent. I take another step forward. Make another ac ac acrobatics check because the ground is still uneven. 
and you're moving again. It is the rule as applied if necessary, but is it appropriate? Is that something that is just going to slow the game right the way down, or is it something that's going to enhance the game and make it more entertaining, whilst at the same time still being consistent and applied to all? It's a complicated tightrope that the GM walks, but if you can apply your rules appropriately with finesse and your players trust you, it can make the game flow like a raging river of excitement and enjoyment as opposed to being one muddy slog after another. The next thing to look at is frequency of use. Frequently confused with the applicability of the rule, is the rule used appropriately, is frequency of use. If you use the same rule over and over and over again and it results in the same outcome, should it really be used? If a character is walking down the street, how many perception checks should they make to notice something's odd? Should it be every 10 feet? Should it be every 10 minutes? That's entirely up to you. At the same time, and from the reverse, if your characters never get to make any rolls because you're not using any of the mechanics or you forget, the infrequency of use is equally damning. You need to make sure that your players get to use the dice that they have spent so much money on or virtually clicked on so many times. You also need to make sure that they're not using them every single moment to do every single thing. There's a balance that needs to be struck, but as with all things that the GM is responsible for, well, that's just part of life. Make a check. On the Training Ground scorecard, story has a lot of sections. The first section to look at is logical narrative. All too often as GMs we try to make complex stories or at least events that our characters are going to experience. We try and make them convoluted and it was actually the husband of the milkmaid's wife's brother's daughter's son-in-law's ex-dog owner's father that was the murderer. It can be a little bit too complicated. On the other hand, if it's absolutely mundane and straightforward, that could be a problem too. The bottom line, though, is that whether it's a straightforward story or a convoluted story, does it make sense when you look at it in its totality? The players are not going to know what's going on during the game, but by the time you get to the final moment where the adventure wraps up, it should make sense and not look as if some kind of crazy spider has crawled all over your plot points to try and connect them in random ways. There should be some kind of structure. Whether you put that in in the planning phase or whether you make it up as you go along doesn't matter. As long as it makes sense, oh yes, he did this, then she did that, and then this caused that, and then that caused that. That's what we're looking for when we look for narrative, logical sense-making. Unlike sentence, make I for you right now. We get the most interestingly difficult point to prove. Engagement or engaging narrative. Well, what does that mean? How do you make your narrative engaging? Hollywood hasn't figured it out after thousands and thousands of movies and millions of hours of television series. Something either grabs the audience or it doesn't. But as the GM, you can make sure that you're putting in as much effort as you possibly can to make your story engaging. Primarily, it's about making sure the players are asking... I wonder what's going to happen next, as opposed to going, oh my goodness, I know what's going to happen next, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, it's so obvious, it's absolutely boring and banal. That is what we want to avoid. How you actually do that, well, that's part of the mastery of being a great GM. When we look at the Training Ground scorecard, we see that pace is listed as one of the critical elements that will be scored, and pace falls under story. Now, pace is something that is incredibly subjective and very personal. I have many videos where I talk about how to create pace and how to make sure that your game is paced correctly, the one-to-one -one method, the five-step method, all of those kinds of things. You can find those on the YouTube channel. Now, when we come to looking at pace, as a player, you are much more invested in the game than as an observer. 
As a player, though, you should never become an observer. If you are becoming an observer, it means that you're out of the game, you're watching what other people are doing, the pace is not fast enough to keep you in the game. It's slowed right down. That's not to say that a slow pace is bad. Sometimes it does happen, and for those quiet, intimate moments around a campfire, the pacing should be slow. However, during combat, the pacing should feel as if it's life or death. It should be paced up. There shouldn't be long pauses. If there are, the question to be asked is, are they coming from your fellow players, which is not the GM's fault to a degree, or is it coming from the GM who's taking so long to make their decision calls, to react, to use their NPCs, to set up the scene? Pacing is a two-way street. Players and GMs interchangeably have control over the pace. However, the GM is ultimately always responsible for driving the game forward. And if they're not doing it, then maybe they need to score lowly so they can work on improving that score. <laughs> okay, we are back. <sighs> The scores are in. They've been calculated. They have been put together. I see chat has been talking as well in terms of the scores that they would be giving. I think this is it's fantastic. Everybody's saying that they had a great time, uh, regardless of whatever the scores are. So I'm not going to drag it out. Let's go to the score. Here is your score. And um, they won't be able to hear you guys talk, but they'll be able to hear me talk. So there is your score. Fair application, 18 out of 25. Consistent application, 20 out of 25. Used appropriately, 19 out of 25. Frequency of use, 21 out of 25. Overall, pretty good results for your rules applications and your, your usage of that. I think that works really well. When you look at the story, you've got 18s and 19s and 17s across the board. I think obviously a big challenge is you've only got 90 minutes. What kind of story can you make? And if you think about it, we packed in breaking into a church, getting into the sewers, breaking out the sewers and then having a combat. I think that went very well. So there are just points that you could look at in terms of pacing as well as I think from a, a player perspective. Um, I think a lot of your emphasis was on getting us through the adventure and not necessarily letting us explore through the adventure as we were going. That is a toss up and we are running a game in 90 minutes. So I think that that is something to bear in mind as well. Otherwise, everyone was was pretty happy with that. NPCs, you've got 17s, 16s, and a 19 in terms of the NPCs used correctly. I think the personalities, the descriptions were good, but I think what we could look at there is making them more distinct. I know I personally sometimes had difficulty following who, how many things were where and, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, again, that simply could be a case of, of uh, just just making sure each character is is, is a little bit more rounded in your description, giving them a little bit more love, a little bit more time. From a style perspective, it's pretty much 18 in average. Uh, your descriptions were good. Your engagement was great. You you used senses. Um, I think there's maybe a little bit more room in there. Um, although I think you 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 described the sewer very well. Table management, your highest score there. Time management, 23 out of 25. That's almost full marks. It means you're really good at table management, uh, time management, I should say, from, from keeping things on track. That's really good. Um, equality of time could be something to look at. I think some people were waiting a little bit while other things were happening. Um, but again, it's the first time you've played with us. So it's also difficult to know how to handle your players. So there are your scores. I think that is absolutely fantastic to get. And uh, I think everybody, did you guys have fun playing in Stefan's game? Yes, Michael. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. definitely. All right, good. So, yes, I think we all had a lot of fun. You know, it's so rare that you get a bunch of players around a table. We clicked quite well. I thought we, we, we were playing off of each other to our strengths and things. And to have a GM who allowed us to do that, as well as to, to take us on this whole journey, was was fantastic. So um, looking at the at the responses, everyone saying, yep, great job, uh, Stefan, well done. Uh, and the players had fun, and we all did too. That's from uh, 
uh, Kirk Hasty on uh, YouTube. Uh, Jay Walker says, needs to strengthen his NPCs, but maybe give them a bit better AI, artificial intelligence, maybe have those reactions. I think what um, Jay is saying there, I almost resonate with in terms of the reactions of the priests and things. Again, you didn't want to muddle it up. You didn't want it to, to kind of get in the way. Um, um, if, if I could really quickly, uh, on that one, I would yes. also like to point out, in case people weren't aware, that um, the, our GM for today is bilingual. And um, while I normally am also very critical of the exact same thing, when we are using a language that we, say, don't necessarily commonly use all the time, trying to make those distinct personalities with the use of our different tones and voice and stuff like that becomes its own challenge. So there's a little bit I can give to that in terms of, I mean, I reckon the game, if it were run in German and every one of the players was German, um, I think there's a stronger suit in that. Absolutely. Um, there is a question that's come through. We've got a few minutes. If you do have questions, just type the word question in caps lock in front of your question. Uh, AK Writer asks, um, did Stefan have any chance to communicate with his players before the game? Uh, Stefan, go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> well, like we are in a, um, we had a Discord room, but we really didn't talk about anything at all. Um, I know that like the question for a session zero came up, but we said that there will be no session zero. And I just got to get to know this lovely bunch of people, um, minus one, because um, Gabe was just like, I had 30 seconds to get to know Gabe um, and all the others for 30 minutes before we started to play. And in those 30 minutes, we were doing technicals. We were trying to figure out stuff. So I would say you had very little chance to speak yeah. with any of us. None of us had spoken, I think, in person really before then. And uh, yes, Gabe got thrown in literally, well, as you saw at the beginning of the show, whilst I was talking. So there was very little time to prep anything. And I think that, uh, again, is is just indicative um, of the, the game. I'm just seeing if there are any more comments. Uh, uh, Gakukon or Gasson, I'm not sure, says no session zero. You played in hard mode. Um, Eric says, How long has Stefan been playing TTRPGs as a player prior to their first time GMing? How long have you been playing before you started um, GMing? To be honest, I played in just a couple of games because I'm like, Oh, you bought a, a Players and Dungeon Masters guide, you're going to be a DM forever um, kind of person. Um, I got to play in some games, but if I just count that all together, it would be like one or two years or three years, maybe. Is this your first game jammed in English or have you had experience before? That was my first game that I ever played in English. Oh, I DM'd in English. And from now on, you are always going to include dryads in your game. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm going to overthink that one, I guess. Um, that was just, I shot myself into the leg with that one. Extreme Sai asks a very valid question. Um, how do you feel about your scores? I feel great. Um, I do absolutely understand that with the NPCs, and though I um, appreciate that you pointed out me being bilingual, I applied for this show, um, so I totally accept that there is room to improve that, and I could also transport that into German, even though it's probably easier to do some accents. That's not the only thing to do a character or to present it being more memorable. Um, so therefore, I have to overthink the things I did. That's why I'm here. And for the next session, try to improve on that perspective, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good a good approach to take. One last question. Azera2000 says, what would the players want more of? Very quickly, let's start with Bracklaw. What would you have wanted more of? Oh, maybe a little bit more social interactions. I not pretty sure. It was pretty balanced for my part, but maybe that a little bit. Sure, sure. Benson, anything? Uh, I would say the same. I think the interactions and the combat were really balanced. So There we go. Yeah. Sasha, anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would have to say is just, we, we've already touched on it, is just the any NPC interactions. Just um, it got muddled with me slightly in like the numbers and, and um, who I might be talking to versus the just the whole group. So just maybe some distinct individuality there, but that's maybe the harshest criticism I would have. Tadja? Um, probably for me, um, I would have liked to have seen how um, how our GM would have handled like a puzzle scenario. 
like traps or mm. riddles and stuff like that. Like getting to see combat and social stuff is great. But for me, I also like to see how um, a GM would run like a scenario which challenges uh, both the player as well as the the characters that they play as well. Um, that would have been cool. It's tricky with time though. Puzzles. Mm, it is. It is very tricky. Time. Yeah. Um, then finally, and, and it's just because we have one minute left. Eric, oh, one question. Him... What, what oh, would you yes. have said? Guy, what would you have said? What would you have loved to see? <laughs> Yeah, um, oh yeah. I would have liked to have played for three hours personally, <laughs> uh, just because I think that everyone had such interesting takes on their characters. I wanted to spend more time talking to the characters. Um, I love a good. Uh, I thought it was a heist, so let's try and steal the thing. Um, I really liked what you did with the the write up. I literally gave you a little paragraph. Uh, you took that and turned it into something else. I liked the festival and stuff. Again, I felt the festival. It was a nice setup. But nothing really happened with that. It could we could have done something more there. I think if you had put the dryads doing a play, or pretending to be foliage in the back of a play, background of a play, that the you, you see some dryads pretending to be trees, <laughs> maybe that would have. But I mean that's finessing, and that's me with twenty twenty vision, right? Uh, looking back. So the last question, and I think this is important. We're going to take it very quickly. Eric Hehem level three says, "Was there anything in particular that you, the GM, found as an unexpected challenge during the session?" There, I'd go with the social interaction in the beginning because I definitely planned it differently. I thought it'd be like obvious that one of the barbarians was kind of lactosis intolerant. You could get him to run away. And the other one was looking at his friends and because one of them, you could have figured that out, could have, um, that it's his son and he's caring about him. And if you messed up with the dwarves who are the dwarf tet playing uh, Bieber tone music and the barbardians who are playing aggressive style music and getting their fan clubs against each other, that would have caused a mess and the other one ran away. That was my intention. But then Tajo came up with the wonderful plan of the command and before Ishka could turn it into a carnage, I thought I'd roll with that. So I go with that one. <laughs> um, that totally went different to what I expected. Nice, nice. Excellent. Uh, uh, well, um, and we're out of time. Sorry, Michael. No, no, um, I, was, I was just going to say that I'm glad the barbarians weren't allergic to shellfish after all that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? A big <laughs> thank you to all of my players. I'm a player now too. Hmm. How do I yeah. end this show off? A big thank you um, to my fellow players uh, for uh, taking the time to play in the game this evening. A uh, big thank you um, to all of you for being part of this. And of course, a gigantic thank you to you, Stefan, for being the first GM out the gate. We will see Stefan next week as he returns to hopefully improve some of those scores and uh, see how he does in another 90-minute session when I'm joined with another group of players as we continue to play in this remarkable game. Thank you to all of you for watching for staying with us and uh, for commenting and sharing your thoughts it is fantastic so until next week all i have to say to all of you is goodbye and happy 